Welcome to Take the Lead Radio with Dr. Diane Hamilton, where she interviews some of the most successful leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and other individuals who will inspire you to take the lead in your career and personal life. And now, here is Dr. Diane Hamilton. I am here with Tom Peters, who is the co-author of In Search of Excellence. Everybody knows his book. It's amazing, but he's got a new one, and I'm very excited, titled Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. It is so nice to have you here, Tom. It is an absolute delight to be here with you, even as you know, we had some slight confusion because the great state of Arizona chooses not to join the rest of us and be on Daylight Savings. I know so. what is that I love it though actually I never have to change my clock but you guys oh, no, need, you need to switch it so you come back there <laughs> uh, well I agree uh, absolutely because I'm a morning person and I love it when it's light early in yeah. the morning but most people I guess they want to hang around for cocktails and have it be light at nine at night or something like that I think I don't know but I I'm so glad we made this work because we had so much fun when you were on the show last time I love that we bonded over Monty Python and everything else and John Cleese specifically but uh, I I love Wait a minute. you're a pretty powerful person don't you think you could get John Cleese and we could do a three-way one sometime? I would love to do that. But since you met him and turned him down or you didn't ask him the question, I can try to remember which it was. Um, it was that I lost my nerve <laughs> because I could not imagine being in a studio with John Cleese. I figured, you know, I go out of my way, I fly to England and then I sit in front of the camera and I can't talk. Oh, well, I'll do it if you both agree to do the silly walks at the same time. I would love that. <laughs> oh, I would I would train for a month for the silly walk. Wouldn't that be the best? Yeah. I would love it. But uh, it's so nice to have you here. And I loved our conversation last time. We got into so much um, about curiosity, which of course I love. That's my background. And we got into so many things that uh, you were working on and have talked about. I follow you on Twitter. You're quite active. I'll tell you, you have very interesting and, and exciting conversations on there. So I was, uh, you know, the thing, the thing about it is, Diane, is, I mean, I enjoy it in general, mm -hmm. but some of the people you get connected with, yeah, I, there was some reason that something was going on a couple of months ago. And I don't know whether I mentioned Enron or not, but Enron, if you recall, had a whistleblower right. and her name was Sharon Watkins. Right. So Sharon sends me a tweet. And I responded to her with a direct message and we proceeded to have a several day conversation. And, you know, holy moly. I mean, to me, be you know, meeting Sharon Watkins was, you know, like meeting royalty. And so there, there've been a dozen of those things over the years where it's somebody you can't believe you actually are talking with. And, yeah. and uh, so like that, this. I know I mean, the, whole, the, whole, the, the whole thing is fun. So, well, you know, I had Bethany McLean on my show and she was the one who wrote the book about Enron. And so yep. I loved that conversation as well. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, was it Bethany? Bethany, I wanted her name, but they didn't have room. I just did a piece for the Financial Times and it was about McKinsey's misbehavior. Mm -hmm. And I actually worked with the Enron villain uh which one <laughs> jeff well jeff skilling <laughs> okay <laughs> for a little while and uh -huh. but the title of the book we were then i then got off in the piece on mbas and so on and we were talking about the limitations of iq and i said well bethany's book was titled the smartest guy in the room right which is a clear indication of the limitations of uh scoring high on a numeric IQ test and scoring incredibly low on a human decency test. Wow. Well, you'll have to talk to her about that. <laughs> well, no, it's cool. It was, it, was the, it was the great, I mean, the book was great. Uh -huh. Yeah, it there, was there, was, great there was another one like that. A guy who used to be a New York Times business columnist, Joe Nocera, and he wrote one on the 2006 crash and it was called All the Devils Are Here. And it was basically that there were a million levels of responsibility that, you know, went from somebody who was giving mortgages to people who didn't have jobs 
all the way up to the people who were giving the ratings, bond ratings to the, you know, to the derivatives. And that was great too. Well, you write about so many different things and you research some, that's why I was really interested to see what you were going to write about in this book. I loved one of your tweets. I got to, I was going to go back and look at it, but since we had to move this up a little bit and I, it was something like, yeah, it's the same old stuff kind of, you had a really funny thing that you wrote <laughs> about that, but it isn't the same old stuff. You have new content and new, um, additional uh, insights for leadership in this book. And I want to know what, what made you write this book and, and who is it aimed at? Uh, well, I just passed my 200th birthday. <laughs> if you saw a picture of Washington crossing the Delaware and his boat, <laughs> one of the oarsmen was me, uh, which is a long-winded way of saying uh, I met, I call the book a memoir. Uh, and as a friend of mine says, a memoir of ideas. And I do say in the book that the research for In Search of Excellence started 43 years ago. And I've been saying the same damn thing for 43 years. And my smart aleck remark was, I love it if you will give me royalties off of the new book. But I guarantee you that each of the 19 books say precisely the same thing. And they do. You know, they, they fundamentally say, behave decently. Uh, when, when, the, when the COVID crisis came along, more or less 12 months to the day ago, uh, my wife, who is, among other things, a tapestry artist, was stitching and knitting masks. And I just felt like she was doing something useful. And I was sitting on my buns in my office. And Shelly and I chatted. Shelly is my colleague of 20 odd years. Uh, and I said, why don't we be audacious, audacious and maybe a little egocentric and go around the podcasters and say, Tom would love to talk to you about leadership in COVID times. And a lot of people responded. And, and I had a ball. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to read for, to you because it'll only take two seconds no, from an early page of the book. Uh, we call it the Leadership 7 COVID-19. And the Leadership 7 is be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, be present, walk in the other person's shoes. And, you know, I was saying to somebody, so make me a manager now in some organization and we have a Zoom meeting every two days. And you always show up on time, which is lovely. And I said, you know what, Diane, you're going to get a low score from me because life is a god awful mess. We have our parents. We have our community. We have our children. Uh, we are not all supposed to be at every meeting on time because <laughs> stuff happens. And yeah. So I am absolutely delighted if, you know, Twice a month, you know, you miss the meeting, you come late to the meeting, but, but that's the way life is right now. And, 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 you know, I was, it was obviously metaphorical in a way, but it was, it was also deadly serious and relative to at least one part of our conversation. I always, at the end of these things, like that COVID-19 list, I always hold my hands up to my mouth and I always say, and guess what? It actually works in the market. Uh, if you have people you have been kind to, the odds are that they are going to behave in a very thoughtful way during the workday and is very likely. Uh, John DeJulius wrote a book. Uh, he's a sales, kind of a management sales guru, owned a bunch of salons and so on. And the one liner of his that's in my book that I love is he said, your customers will never be any happier than your employees. And it's a quote unquote one liner, but I, I think it is 99 and a half percent accurate. You know, and you brought up some really interesting points because I had um, taken a, a job not that long ago where it was right off the bat, they go, well, everybody works 70 hours a week, so but things have gotten worse, so we're gonna have to buckle down. <laughs> and you think they, <laughs> so there, and I'm like, yeah, I, this isn't the job for me, you know? And we, yeah. you, you know, and, they're, they're like, well, why, why, in the exit interview, they're like, well, why would you leave, you know, every, and how do you get through to people that, that 
that this is what we're doing. We're over amping. I mean, Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after, you know, they're overdoing it so much now. Yeah, well, I mean, if you use continued with my example, you're the boss and you're late to some meetings. Yeah. You know, my, my 87 year old mother is really having some problems living by herself. And, you know, we're not going to be able to start this meeting at 10 o'clock this morning. I don't know if we're going to be able to have it today. Uh, but, you know, it, I, you and I were talking a little bit before we started. I mean, the, the essence of it, essence is, is, is a pretty big word, was when all this stuff started, I remember seeing, and I don't know it was on Twitter where it was, which doesn't matter anyway. Uh, so you are a significant television personality newscaster and you're now doing your thing from your home and there is case a and case b and of course you are case b case a me case a is me <laughs> and i'm talking to the planet about all sorts of important things and my four-year-old didn't care about the closed deer closed door mm -hmm. and wanders into the setting and in a visible way, I go like that. Uh, you are now the newscaster uh, and your three-year-old pays no attention to the door and walks into the room. And while you're on the air, you get a big smile on your face and you pick him up and you say, Jason, I want you to meet a whole bunch of new people or, or what have you, or you just give him a hug. Right. And I mean, you could, you could argue that some people would do that in a manipulative fashion, but you're, you, you, have, you have raised your credibility with your audience of one and a quarter million people by, if not an order, order of magnitude, at least four points on a 10 scale. And it's just, I mean, I, it, it works in the quote unquote real world of non-Zoom, but even more because everybody is under pressure. Right. There's nobody who's not. We might not all have 87 year old mothers, uh, but stuff is going wrong uh, amidst us. And, you know, statistically speaking, if you've got kind of a circle of friends in your community of 25 or 30 people, one of them's probably had a COVID problem. And so, you know, human humanization always works. And then well, I, I got to tell you my favorite either two words or four words. Okay. David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, wrote a column a couple of years ago. I think it came out of a book of his. And he contrasted what he called resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. Mm -hmm. And resume virtues are that I went to Duke University and I had a 4.2 grade point average and I went to work for Deloitte and Touche, and I was promoted six times in the first nine years, et cetera, et cetera. Stuff you've quote unquote accomplished that you put on a resume. And the eulogy virtues to state the office are when dearly beloved, which will not happen for a million years, Diane passes away. What do people say at her funeral? And they do not say, well, Diane was promoted six times during her 23 years at Deloitte and Touche. I, I have a slide I use in my presentation, a little PowerPoint slide that has a tomb. And on the tomb, it has 11,713,611 dollars and 19 cents. And then under it, it says net worth when the market closed on the day that Tom died. And my point is, you know, which is true. My ex-wife father did tombstones in, in Missouri. So, uh, you know, you're, you're talking to somebody who knows tombstones. Uh -huh. I said, I've looked at a lot of tombstones and I've never seen one with a net worth on it. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, I, but I think, I think the point. first thing is found, resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. And, and darn it, which is the hard point for some reason, statistically speaking, Unless you were born with a sterling silver spoon, you will spend more time at work than you will even with your family. Yeah. And so your signature in life as a human being is to a significant degree is your working life. 
And, you know, and the other thing I said during the COVID thing, which I also believe, and maybe we're edging a little bit out of it, is I said, the way you be have behaved in the last 90 days and the way you will behave in the next 90 days will be the signature of your adult, adult life. Um, you know, this is a, and we pray this is true. This is a once every 100 year event. Uh, we hope. Yeah. Uh, and which means you don't get a second crack at it. And the way you behave while the war, you know, it's Rosie the Riveter. You're right. Who was actually, and she was a socialite. She was like, not somebody off the streets. And yeah. the way Rosie behaved and the yeah. symbol she became during World War II, that's who she was. She had a lovely, productive life. Diane has a lovely, productive life. So does Tom. But the definition is how you behaved when all the yogurt hit the fan. Well, we're finding that out right now, for sure. <laughs> and it, it's an interesting time to see how people are, are leading and pivoting. And, you know, I'm looking at that list that you just mentioned, and I'm wondering, the last one is a lot about empathy, walking in another person's shoes. Um, so I'm curious where curiosity falls, since we talked so much about that last time. In the yeah. Well, among other things, and you may disagree, but you have to let me finish my sentence. <laughs> okay. uh, curiosity follows from the other stuff. Okay. If you and I, I'm your boss, and if invariably, in ye olde days, uh -huh. when I walk into the office, you're there because you have this problem so you're always early <laughs> and four mornings out of five you and I have a 10 minute conversation and you know we may talk a little bit about your spouse or your mother or your community or what have you but we're going to just get into stuff and to me the essence of to me well there were several things which we talked about part of the essence of curiosity is casual chit chat among people there was this there was this uh uh big architecture firm that i had in a pbs show and they did this thing that kind of sounds funny but not and they <clears throat> had on the floor i saw the men's room and the women's room were right next to each other and they put some chairs there outside and they said, you know, you come out of the come out of the toilet and you know, you sit down for a second. And I have a rant. They, they were trying to increase the volume of random conversations. Huh. Uh, because I think that's where most of the funny little twists and turns and strands are gonna occur. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to go this far at all, but I remember there was a guy by the name of Dave Bing who wrote a column in Fortune Forever. And I don't remember whether we were going past the kind of prohibition period where people were worried about alcohol more than normal. But he said, there won't be any more entrepreneurs once we stop the two martini lunch. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, it's at yeah. the end of the second martini when you believe you can conquer the world. Right. Really yeah. wild yeah. stuff starts yeah. coming out of your mouth. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, promoting uh, Jack Daniels on, in this conversation. But that to me, and, and I mean, it, I don't know whether it has to be empathy. I mean, curiosity to me is people who are interested in damn near everything. Because I think, as we said, to me, curiosity is horizontal, not vertical. And horizontal, and I was tweeting about this yesterday, is one of the reasons that I, who am in a in a tech firm and has 23 code writers working for me. Mm -hmm. I want one theater major. I want one music major. I want one philosophy major. Mm -hmm. I want somebody who is just bright as the Dickens, but for family reasons, never did make it through formal schooling. Uh, and it's, and, and, I, and there was an exchange at Twitter where somebody said that. They said, I was on this incredible. No, it was a guy I was walking with yesterday and he worked for the CIA in a very sophisticated operation. And he said, when we put teams together, we always look for somebody who had a musical background. 
because she slash he would come at the problem differently. Yeah. And you know, that, that to me, you're the pro, but that to me is the, is the essence of curiosity. Somebody who, you know, is thinking about Bach while you're thinking about third derivative calculus equations. Well, I, I think you're talking a lot about like range and I love the book range because I think that yes. you can get so much from so many different areas. And so uh, a lot of this uh, I talk about with other people on the show, because I think all these things you mentioned are really important to, to being a, um, a caring, you know, successful leader. And I think right now, I think the ones who really are successful have shown a lot of these qualities that you're talking about. But I, I think that a lot of people are really kind of unnerved by having to go back to what's going to be next. Do we work, you know, today's Wall Street Journal, we're going to work at home and at the, you know, I mean, <laughs> we're going to be doing right. both, right? So are we going to be doing both? What do you foresee for leadership? Is it going to be as challenging? Is it a different setting than we've had for the last year? What's next? Well, I think it's going to be both. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be both in part because the pandemic coincided, <clears throat> among other things, with the exponential growth of artificial intelligence and tools to allow us to be together when we're not together, get better and better and better with every passing day. So I think, I think both is a no-brainer. Uh, and there are a lot of things I could say, but the one I would say uh, and I knew better because I'm well-trained actually in psychology, particularly well-trained for an engineer, uh, that when I started doing podcasts, for example, I'm one of those people who has to, no, it's not, I don't have to be two inches apart, but I got to see you and have my face de facto touching your face. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I can't do that in a podcast. Right. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> and I really, really, really wrong because take this conversation. I think this conversation in the best sense of the word is as emotional and conversational and laden with meaning as it would be maybe more than if I was sitting at the end of the table and you were four chairs down. Uh, and so I think we, I mean, fascinating thing. Uh, my brother-in-law is a teacher hmm. and we were talking about this and he said, which I just loved for a lot of reasons. He said, I can teach kids in a room and I can teach kids by zoom, but I can't do a mix of kids in the room and zoom yeah. because in order to be a teacher, I've got to make serious eye contact with you. And I can't have the kind of eye, to eye contact you and I are having right now. And at the same time, be looking down at 14 people sitting in their chairs. Yeah. And I thought it was a, a brilliant either insight or observation or what have you. But I'm. I mean, the, the other thing I said relative to all this and, the, and, and your question and also has to do with curiosity is and this may change in a few years. There are no experts. You have to experiment. Yeah. You got to figure it out for yourself. And you like any new product, you're going to make 173 mistakes before you kind of get a ritual that works. But I know there will be 257.6 books about work from home <laughs> within five years. But yeah. right now they aren't. And just play with it. And, and again, relative to what you are saying before, acknowledge to your teammates that you're playing with it. You know, say to them, this Zoom thing is new to me. I have no idea in the world what the hell we're doing. I have no other idea whether this is going to be a bust or genius. And we'll all try. But there's this horrible sort of thing that makes me sick at my stomach. Uh, like, <laughs> I guess it exists using software that records the airtime of each of the people in your meeting and be having a screen where you look at it. I mean, dear God, that is theory X on steroids. Uh, you know, any good leader worth her or his salt uh, is working to induce the quiet person in the corner with a frown uh -huh. to, right. to just 
you know, give us your meaning. By the way, one thing that's not trivial to you, nor is it to me, and I, I saw this and this popped up on Twitter as well, uh, and it was research that said in, in settings like Zoom, who talks the most, men or women? And the consistent quote unquote theory was it was women, those chatty people. The reality was by a big margin, it was the I got to show my face and make my mark egocentric boy. <laughs> and, and I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Did you happen to see that uh, there was um, a, a research out of Oxford, I think, uh, about curiosity of how men are two and a half times more likely to ask questions. I know you do a lot of things with comments about women be, should run the world and all this stuff. So you're very pro-women. And I, I thought, oh, you'd probably find this curiosity um, data interesting. Women don't want to raise their hand um, until there's like six questions asked where men will ask a lot more questions. And uh, it's just they're late to getting to the the question asking part uh, after watching like a seminar or something like that. Yeah. I mean, do you think this because we're just later to the, the party uh, in leadership than and in business in general, or do you think that's kind of an innate thing? Or I'm just curious what you think about uh, how women don't talk as much on Zoom or. Other yeah, well, I've got to tell you one tiny story that once again came off Twitter, which is relevant to our conversation. And I almost got ill. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> um, I'm a salesperson male you are a customer female okay and i want to learn more about your needs and so i'm asking you questions uh i've asked you four questions and you've replied and in the middle of your reply i've always interrupted you so i ask the fifth question and diane sits there and she just sits there. And finally, I say, well, aren't you going to answer? And Diane says, well, you always answer your own questions anyway. I just thought I'd wait. Honest to gosh. See, I hate to use language like this, but I almost peed my pants. I was laughing so hard. Uh, I mean, the, the answer is I've done an amazing amount of reading, but I do happen to be male. And I think it has to do with all those things that you've experienced since you we're part of organizations of women are supposed to behave in a slightly different way. I mean, it, it, and maybe not so slightly different. And I believe it's a pretty solid combination of, from my reading, there's a wonderful book, Woman at the University of San Francisco, California, which is a big, wonderful medical school. And she is a neuropsychiatrist. And she wrote an incredible book called The Female Brain. Uh, and one little piece of it, which is only indirectly related, but I just love it so much. Uh, by the age of five days, Diane was making three times more eye contact with her fellow human beings than I was. And it's that community thing. One thing I have to say, and I know I'm going all over the place, my apologies. There's a wonderful book that we have to talk about and it's called Compassionomics. And it's about compassion in healthcare, pays off and builds healthier people, uh, you know, which is, which is really terrific. What was I gonna say? Um, 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 um. I made God, eye contact I remember. as a baby. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Well, this is, a, yeah, it is about eye contact, but it was something else I was going to say from the book. Well, the eye contact thing is just unbelievable. And the two gentlemen who wrote it are MDs and they are hard ass researchers. And I love the title of the book, Compassionomics, because it means MBAs can't ignore it. <laughs> uh, and, and basically they came up lots of studies with the magic number 37, if Dr. Tom, well, we'll make you the doctor because I don't want you to be, to have a disease. Uh, if Dr. Diane uh -huh. is talking to cancer patient Tom, who's in a bad way, 
and Dr. Diane makes 37 or more seconds of direct eye contact, I will have less complications. I will get out of the hospital 25% sooner and a jillion other variables. And it's just because we human, I have, I have a neighbor and she teaches in a med school and tries to teach med schools communication skill, medical students communication skills. And, and right at the top of the list is things like eye contact. Right. Uh, you know, I did, I did a TV show. We did this wonderful high school principal and we were filming it. And I remember, I didn't know this was coming. Uh, we go into the classroom. His name was Dennis Litke, and he wants to talk to Diane. And it was one of those old school chairs. You're too young to remember the brother B. Uh, and Dennis goes into the classroom and he's going to have a conversation with Diane. And he gets down on his knees. And I said, what the hell was that all about? He said, if I'm going to have a serious conversation with Diane, we, we have to have our faces on the same level. When I look down at Diane, the whole chemistry of the conversation becomes different. And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's absolutely true. Um, but I mean, when, stuff like that to me is like bombs bursting in air be, because yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely so important. The other thing Dennis did, which was great uh, with his kids, he was a high school principal with his kids is he had, you know, speakers once a week or once a month, and wow, did he go for diversity? Yeah. You know, he was in a small New Hampshire town. He had a guy who was a canoe builder and he had people who did every damn thing that you could possibly imagine because he just wanted the kids to get a flavor of the, who the human being was and also kind of the intellectual process that a canoe maker would talk about in the world of canoes that seems to be a lot different from, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade math. Well, you have so many interesting stories. I remember this from last time. And I'm curious, do you, is this book going to include a lot of these stories or are you going in a different direction? I haven't had a chance to see it because it comes out today. I'm really honored, by the way, that I got you on the day of the launch. Yes. but So, so I haven't had it yet. And I want to know, I am teaching right now a class at a technology uh, school, and I'm going to share this tomorrow in the class when I do this Teams session. What can you teach them? They're starting their own companies. They're, they're trying to come up with a technology-based system. What is the most important thing they can learn about leadership? Because uh, right now they're designing their structure and doing all those things in their mind. What can they learn from your book that I can share with them tomorrow? Well, one hopes the book is, a, is reflected in our conversation. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you, you and I are having a, we, uh, we've never met in person. We've only had an hour together. Sorry. And we are having a very attractive human conversation. And, you know, it feels like we're second cousins, if not first <laughs> cousins. Uh, and people may have that instinct, but let me, let me, I'm going to read you something that is from the book that is indirectly related. The good news is it has to do with technology. And this is about Google. Google employees tend to be Stanford computer science graduates with IQs of a minimum of 600 uh, who, you know, love to code and haven't looked up from their computer for the last four, if not 14 years. So Project Oxygen, data from founding 1998 to 2013, shocked everyone at Google by concluding that among the eight most important qualities of Google's top employees, STEM expertise comes in dead last. <laughs> The seven top characteristics of success of Google's most successful employees are all soft skills. Yeah. Being a good coach, communicating and listening well, possessing insights into others, including others' different points of view, having empathy toward and being supportive of one's colleagues, da-da-da-da-da. 
project Aristotle further supports the importance of soft skills. Google takes pride, this makes me sick at my stomach, we can talk about that later, in its A teams, established with top scientists, each with the most specialized knowledge and able to throw down one cutting edge idea after another. Its data analysis revealed, however, that the company's most important and productive innovation came from B teams, comprised of employees that don't always have to be the smartest in the room. Project Aristotle shows that the best teams at Google exhibit a range of soft skills, equality, generosity, curious toward the ideas of others, and so on. And that's Google. And there ain't no tougher technology organization around than Google. But the, the magic is these soft skills. Yeah. Uh, this does you no good, but I hope I can say something that does. Okay. Uh, my bias is if I want that in my company, well, it does in part. Uh, attribute number one of every employee you hire is empathy, period. There's a quote in the book from a guy who is the CEO of a biotech company. And he said, we think the most important part of the company is our culture. To continue that culture, we only hire nice people. And that, but then he puts an asterisk, which is really the important part. Uh -huh. He said, some of the degree requirements for some of our jobs, you wouldn't even understand the words that were in the title of the degree that that person got. Right. Uh, but he said, uh -huh. I learned the secret. Uh, even though it is the most sophisticated, bizarre you know, technology or skill you know, there are a lot of people around who have that skill, don't hire the jerks. <laughs> and so it's not just we want this in people who are at the front desk at a hotel, but he said it's true among the scientists, don't hire the jerks. There's, a, there's another wonderful thing like that, and I, maybe this, I think it applies to the people you're talking to. Uh, every darn list that you read always has the Mayo Clinic at or near the top of effective healthcare centers. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of guys whose names I don't remember, and they wrote a book called Management Lessons from the Mayo Clinic. And the one I love best is you are one of the great kidney specialists that there is, and we need one of you. And I'm interviewing you, and we have a 45 minute conversation. There's a dirty little secret that you don't know of. And I know whether I do it on my hand or whether I do it on my iPhone, but during the conversation, I am literally counting the number of times you use the word we and talk about my people and I, my team and I, and the number of times that you use the word I. Right. And if the I's beat the we's, Diane, the smartest and the best of the lot doesn't get hired. Uh, and I, and, and the thing about this is you could say, well, that's soft stuff. Well, damn it, it's not. Because this, this patient-centric team medicine came out of the mouth of Dr. Mayo in 1914. Wow. And there is a woman surgeon who works in the big Mayo Clinic. And she said, obviously not meaning it literally, but she is a surgeon, so she's not, you know, she talks straight. She said, I am a hundred times more powerful here than I was in my last job. Because everything we do, we do together, learn from each other together, and, and so on. And then there was this young kid. I mean, I just love the book. There's this young kid, young kid MD, uh, and he's doing whatever he's doing, or she's doing whatever she's doing, and she gets a call. And the call comes from Surgeon Diane, who is in the OR. And Surgeon Diane, who's a really big deal, says, Tom, I'm kind of at a turning point here. And I can go one of two ways. And let me explain it to you a little bit. Da 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 da, or da 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 da. You know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. What do you think? And the guy said, Oh my God, you know, I'm 
Tom, the new kid on the block, and this famous surgeon is asking my advice. And it wasn't superficial. He wasn't, this wasn't a quiz test. He, he was testing an idea. And Tom is actually a very smart boy. And he wanted to see what this person who wasn't a normal part of his you know, club, if you will, said. And, 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 th and those are the things that I believe your, your young or younger entrepreneurs ought to look for in every employee, starting with employee number one. Yeah. Uh, if they were a bigger company, I would then say, multiply that by 100 when you're promoting somebody into a first line managerial job. You know, that's such great advice. And I, I have so many questions because I wrote my dissertation on emotional intelligence. So, of course, you went right down that alley for me. Yeah. But, um, I love to talk about this. And Perception, of course, was my last book. So I had so many questions, but I know I'm keeping you past our time. So I want to make sure that Shelly doesn't shoot me and that I get you out of here. But I want to make sure that we have covered everything you want to cover from this book, because I know well, it's an important this book. is your show, not my show. If you well, got not keeping you the rest Shelley, of the day, Shelley's huh? in trouble. <laughs> Shelly gets, I mean, I will be in trouble with Shelly. Uh, I will try a short answer. If you've got a couple of big things that we missed, I will try 30 second answers. You have as much time as you need. I would love to, to have, I, I mean, where does perception fit into all this? Um, I, I think that, you know, when I was studying it, I, I saw it as IQ, EQ, CQ for curiosity quotient, CQ for cultural quotient kind of combined, you know, and if we were able to, it's building that empathy and all the things that we need to do to see things from other people's vantage points. We see that people are having a hard time. They're split politically and all these different things now. How can we work on our perception in, in, in leadership? Well, I'm not an idiot. And I'm not going to comment on yeah. the horrifying, terrifying yeah. divisions that seem to have erupted, particularly in the wake of January the 6th. That's A, I don't have the answers, and B, that would have to be a two hour discussion yeah. over a good California <laughs> nay, which is a problem because I don't drink. Uh, but not because not because I think it's immoral. I don't drink because I thought it was really a good thing, and eventually I decided, yes. time's up. <laughs> uh, well, I you tell me. I think. Well, two answers. I think perception. I think, and I have not studied it the way you have. I think perception and. EQ, CQ are go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, the one thing I do have to say that I think would be valuable to a young entrepreneur, though it's tough medicine, uh, your young Diane or old Diane, either way, your self-perception is wrong. <laughs> oh, no. Not, none of us. I mean, there may be miracle people and you may be one of those miracle people. Uh, yeah, little, little one of those stories like another story. Some researchers did a very quantitative analysis of meetings. And I'm the guy who's the head of the meeting. And we had a 45 minute meeting and you're the researcher and this was your issue. And at the end of the meeting, you said, Tom, how many times were you interrupted? And how many times did you interrupt people? And I wasn't trying to bullshit you because I'm the boss. I'm the one who hired you, for God's sakes. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I was probably interrupted at least seven or eight times. And I will admit that I interrupted a couple of times myself. Well, he got the numbers right, but it was reversed. You know, the real count said 
Tom had interrupted seven times and been interrupted yeah. twice. And, and that's self perception. He wasn't, he wasn't lying. Yeah. It would be lovely if he was trying to be right? Yeah. But just, that's the way that's, that's what was loaded into his head. I had a horrible example of that. A person who I know very well, who was a very senior person in a big company and he was headed for one level higher. And before they promoted him, they did all these heavyweight three sixties and so on. And this is a maximum 1% exaggeration. He thought he was beloved and he was universally despised. I mean, <laughs> that's it was a big difference. You know, that's a, that's go, go to a shrink before you yeah. do personal harm at, uh -huh. at, at, at some level. Uh, but I mean, one thing I, you may have studied this, I studied it and then have restudied it. Uh, Anybody who has any job ought to study cognitive biases. Yeah. We are so unaware. There's, there's a, I Googled, or I Googled Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has a cognitive bias piece. And I laughed so hard, I was almost hysterical. They listed 159 cognitive biases, which I thought that was a little high. But the point is, that that we just don't know the degree to which you know that's part of the process and so uh the best the best and the most important part of perception is talking with and working with and hanging out with a whole lot of people who can come at the world with a different perspectives or can be help you a lot in understanding the way that you thought you were in a good place and you came across as a grouch <laughs> Uh, and now I do have to go or Shelley will kill me. I know. Well, I, I loved that. I saw that uh, Susan Kane reviewed your book and said such great things. And as you talk about coming from different places, she, of course, looks at it from an introverted standpoint. And you're, you're looking at so many different reviews of from people who, who had such wonderful things to say about your new book. And I'm not surprised. And every time we talk, I have so much fun. So I was really looking forward to this uh, today. Sorry, Shelly, we did go long. And well, my, my only last comment is about Susan Cain. And I always <laughs> make it clear. I said, Susan Cain called me an idiot. <laughs> and I will love her forever as a result of that. And what I meant by it was, you know, as I said, I crossed the Delaware with Washington. I have, I'm in, he said, with no ego, I am incredibly well-educated in psych and social psych. That's what my PhD in, from Stanford is in. Uh, and I thought, excuse the language, I really knew my shit. Uh, her discussion of introversion and introverts, just at the age, I will admit it, at the age of, at the time, 75, flipped my world upside down. You know, this is 50 bloody percent of the population who are dismissed, ignored, underplayed relative to your great love and life. They tend to be significantly more curious because they don't always quick fire and have an answer within two and a quarter seconds after they speak. And, and I just, I love the book and I've met her and I think She's absolutely fantastic. One of the greatest dinners of my life was at some place. I think we were overseas and it was Susan and me and Dan Pink, who I've known. Oh, what a since great dinner party. Yeah. And that was a great, but I had the pleasure of being able to tell her face to face that Susan, I know you think I'm an idiot, but I'm trying. <laughs> uh, but it was de facto. I, was, I felt literally not figuratively embarrassed as I read the book by how incredibly well trained I was and how far I had, how the degree to which I had, had, had missed the boat, missed the ball on that dimension. So it's, it's really ain't nothing more strategic than this introvert extrovert. You know, I, I just loved all the stuff that, that came up. You have a, you have a meeting and you tell people to go spend 20 minutes brainstorming, uh, the extroverts come up with 27 ideas, 26 and a half of which are half-assed. The introverts come up with three ideas, all three of which are good. Yeah. Slight exaggeration, but... Uh.
directionally okay. accurate. Okay, I yes. quit. Okay, that's uh, hey, Ken Fisher agreed with you when I interviewed him that it changed his life. And I think it's a great book, but I think this is going to be, I'm so excited to read it. I, I'm so excited it came out today. And I was really happy to have a chance to interview you again because we had so much fun the last time. And I'm looking forward to the Silly Walks interview. Can you get John ready <laughs> for that? And <laughs> thank you so much and congratulations and good luck. I'm looking forward to the success of your book. Well, thank you on all, for all of those kind words.